look, there's some things that are heavy in life and some things that are serious, totally. But you can't dwell there. You can't live there for too long, right? Because the, the best things to remember are the times when you are, when you're deeply feeling that there's, there's humor there and there's laughter there and there's joy there. And there's been lots of studies on it. You know, you could look up these studies about how, you know, it, it, your, your health, you'll, you'll live longer if you're laughing more. You're listening to the Live Life Longer Show with Dan Voss, inspiring you to a new way of living through breathwork, cold exposure, nature, and plant medicine. In this week's episode, my guest is Larry Rogowski. Larry is a certified nutrition coach and licensed massage therapist. His work has led him to conduct seminars across North America on health and lifestyle practices. When Larry isn't living a life of improving his clients' health and wellness, he lives, in a, he lives a life in the arts. He is a Tony Award-winning Broadway producer. Larry founded Urban Body Fix in 2001, and with a passion for wellness and an engaging spirit, Larry has built a team of health professionals advocating for positive change and powerful choices in health and in life for clients as well as medical practices. Larry, welcome to the Live Life Longer show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Nice yeah, to see you absolutely. and hear yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. We had a, a few uh, technology issues before recording here, so I'm happy we got back on board here and we're all set to go. And uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation, uh, mostly around your book, uh, the Urban Body Fix. I had the chance to um, to go through the book and and see that there's so much of what you talk about, um, not just in your book, but really in, in the work that you're doing. Um, I feel like it's just a really nice kind of package of everything I love to talk about and what I'm passionate about. So um, very much looking forward to getting into some of the contents of, of your book. Uh, but before we get there, I want to hear a little bit more about your story. You know, I talked about, um, you know, your Broadway production career um, and then as well as, you know, you starting Urban Body Fix, which I'd love to hear more about. So maybe you can share a little bit more about your story in um, in Broadway production and then tell us more about how Urban Body Fix came to be. Sure. So, um, well, Urban Body Fix came first, actually, but um, I kind of go, um, I'll, we'll, we'll have a time capsule. We'll sort of travel in time a little bit. So um, I've been a Broadway producer for the past six years. And as everybody knows, you know, a year ago, well, over a year ago now, March 12th was the exact date, Broadway shut down. Mm. So um, that, I think not just me, but that gave that moment or right around there sort of gave everybody a good time to have a hard look at like, what am I doing with my life? What's going yeah. on? <laughs> am I yeah. doing all the stuff I love? And I absolutely love um, producing on um, Broadway. I used to be an actor a million years ago, and it was kind of like getting back to my first love. And at the time of the shutdown, I had three Broadway shows running, Moulin Rouge, Jagged Little Pill, and Company, like these big, awesome hit shows. So it was quite a bummer, as you can imagine. It was a pretty devastating yeah. year in that end. Um, but so I thought, well, what am I going to do now that everything is shut down? And there was really, at the time, there was no end in sight. We didn't know what was happening. So I thought, well, let me focus all my attention back to Urban Body Fix, which has been my company for over 20 years. I started it in Midtown Manhattan, as a licensed massage therapist. And then I added in integrated nutrition coaching to my practice. And, um, and then I became more of a consultant to physicians over the years, uh, implementing wellness programs like supplementation and weight management programs, that sort of thing. Uh, built a whole team of people that work with me to help me implement into these offices. And it just really took on a life of its own. And during all this time, I thought, well, I, well, no, I didn't think. I was told by a good friend of mine and a mentor, you have to write a book. You, you talk about all this great stuff. And, you know, and as the years progressed, it you know, got more and more and more. And she kept saying, you have to write a book, you have to write a book, you have to write a book. So finally, during this, you know, the past 13 months or so, um, I wrote this book called The Urban Body Fix, Everything in Moderation, Especially Moderation. So that was yeah. born out of the past 20 years. But really, the impetus for writing it now was the pandemic. Mm. And, you know, taking a hard look at, okay, what did I always say I was going to do that I haven't done in the book? Yeah. Was one of the That's so cool. I love the name too, Urban Body Fix. Um, you're in New York City. I'm in Chicago. So we're, you know, two urban guys. And I think a lot of times people look at urban living and think that it, it can't be healthy, but it absolutely can mm. be. You can find ways to live a healthy lifestyle to incorporate nature into your life, to eat cleanly, get exercise in. 
um, get movement in, and you encompass all of that, you know, in, in the work you're doing. So I appreciate that, that plug in of that urban lifestyle, but also allowing it to be healthy, which I think sometimes goes to the wayside. Um, and the big, as you mentioned, moderation, the big, you know, kind of theme around your book is, you know, everything in moderation, including moderation. Um, and I know you, you talk about how, you know, we live in a world with, um, a lot of abundance, but also a lot of, um, we have a lot of extreme, we take things to the extreme often and we've all been there before. I, I tend to do it, whether that's with fasting, sometimes I tend to overdo it or, um, I'm big into cold exposure. I think uh, there's so many health benefits to it, and I it's, it's something I've become passionate about, almost obsessed with. Um, but you can overdo that as well with with the cold exposure. So um, tell us a little bit more about what you mean by everything in moderation, including moderation. It's actually especially moderation. I actually changed that word because you know it is sort of a saying: everything in moderation, including moderation. But I just thought I need to have my own sort of twist on this. So for me, I, like it was just just changing up the word and making it especially. Mm. Uh, it, it rang differently for me. Yeah, um, I like that. So I think your example is great of you know the cold exposure, which I also love. I think that's you know there's so many benefits to that. Um, and, and I think sometimes people have to go to extremes to find moderation, and that's okay. And it's like you can't beat yourself up over it. Like. You know, most of the people I know that have um, achieved this sort of level of balance, which, by the way, perfect balance doesn't exist, right? It just yes. doesn't exist. It, we can always be striving for it, but it never actually happens. Um, but you have to kind of kind of go from here to here to find out what's in here. Yeah. I was just talking to somebody the other day about balance, and they said, I don't even like that word balance. It's more harmony. Right, like you're never gonna have everything completely balanced out. It's more about finding harmony with um, whatever it is that you have in your life, whatever practices that you have. And then I use the example of um, it being kind of a dance, right? Like if you're dancing with somebody, you have uh, you have movement, you have um, different steps that you might take. You might uh, it might be synchronized, it might be um, just kind of unplanned, and you kind of just have to work through those things and learn along the way and find that that harmony rather than try to force balance it's like it's like dating or relationships you know yeah. it's like everybody's like looking for that perfect person or even when you're in relationship i've been married for a very long time and um you know it's not always perfect but there is that dance that happens and that's the same yep. thing with your health you're never going to find that perfect spot but you always want to strive for it mm, so true yeah i love that you have, um, in your book, you have kind of, you talk about the three main pillars of, of diet, exercise, lifestyle. Um, walk us through some of those things. And obviously, you know, each one of those could probably be a book in and of itself. Um, I know it's a loaded question. It's like, talk to me about diet. What do we need to know about diet? What should we know about exercise? But um, in the context of your book, what are some of the main kind of takeaways with with diet, exercise, and lifestyle, especially especially the lifestyle piece. I feel like that is something that maybe isn't talked about enough in the health industry. You know, we all know about nutrition and exercise and sleep. And, well, it's the kind uh, of thing you can't quantify. That's the thing with like with diet and exercise. You can sort of plan it out. You can count it. But lifestyle, you really, I think it takes the most work in a sense. Mm. You know, but it's funny what you say with the book. Like, you know, we could we could write a whole book on each of those topics. That was the thing, writing it, I was like, literally every chapter could be its own book, True. you know, um, but I wanted to put it all into one book and maybe there'll be other books that come afterwards, you know, the follow up to the Urban Body Fix. Um, mm. But when it comes to diet, you know, everybody has, to, I, I always say use your body as a laboratory. You need to find what works best for you. There's absolutely science, of course, um, that shows that probably for most people, a plant-based diet is a better way to go. I'm not talking be vegan or vegetarian, but something that's more leaning towards plant-based. Mm. Um, with some exceptions, you know, there's certain people that will do better and they know how they feel on more of an animal protein diet, yep. right? But in general, I'm talking. Um, so finding what works best for you regarding your diet and, um, and balancing that out too. Again, talk about going to extremes. You know, I went on a... Um, 
uh, a wellness retreat probably two months ago to this really cool place in Puerto Rico called the Anne Wigmore Institute. And nice. they are, it's like raw living food, vegan. Uh, we're eating right out of their garden. It is like, it's pretty extreme. It, at least it's extreme for me in the way I live at home. So mm -hmm. going there, I mean, what made it easier is that it's all prepared for you. Yeah. There's classes on it and you're at the ocean, you're swimming there every day, doing yoga classes every day. So it's sort of an idyllic spot to be eating that way. Mm -hmm. um, but that was sort of an extreme. And, I, and it was interesting going there because coming back to my life, you know, I was still doing a lot of the things that I was doing there, but I had to bring in balance and bring in other things that I enjoy. Otherwise, talking about lifestyle with diet now, it's like I just eating that way for life. I would miss out on a lot of the pleasures that I get from different types of food. Yeah. Now, I'm a healthy guy, you know, and if, maybe if you're dealing with some sort of illness, you need to eat that way for longer than I did. You know, some people will need to just totally go that way for the rest of their life in, in certain certain illnesses. But um, in general, you know, it's like adding that in, but then coming back to also what brings you joy and what you, you what, what tastes really good. Yep. Um, so that's diet. And then exercise, same thing. Use your body as a laboratory. I'm a big fan of fun exercise, like uh, hula dancing, or yeah. <laughs> pole dancing, or sure. you know, swimming, and anything that's fun to do. Because if you have exercise that you don't enjoy, you're not going to continue to do it for the long run. You're just going to mm. get sick of it. Or changing up your exercise is a good idea also. Yeah. Yeah. When you say that phrase, use your body as a laboratory, there's two things that come to mind. Number one is experimentation. And number two is listening to your body. And I yeah. think by you going on that wellness retreat and trying new foods and living that way for whatever it was, three, four days or a week or, or whatever, um, you're now able to use that as kind of a, a framework of, did this work for me or not? Did my body respond to it well or not? And, and I will tell you, it, you, sorry to interrupt, but it did. My body really responded and it was clear to me like, wow, I was eating too much animal protein. Mm. I wasn't eating enough. And I know this stuff intellectually, I know it all, but it's when you experience, yeah. I was like, I'm not eating enough greens and enough raw food. I needed to yeah. bring more of that in. It's so interesting you said that. And if I may, I'm actually going to share about myself is almost the opposite. I tried mostly plant-based diet for close to a month. This was like six months ago. And I quickly realized that like, I actually need more animal protein mm. during that, during that kind of experiment, if you will. Um, and now I'm about half and half where it's about half animal protein, half more greens and vegetables. And now it's like, okay, this is where I feel good, I have good energy. I feel clean. Um, it just feels right. And it, it takes a little bit of experimentation. And once you get there, you'll know, like, you'll know that your body's responding well. You can see it in your skin, in your hair, in your eyes, in your energy levels, in your bowel movements. I mean, there's certain signs that you can look at to say, this is working. That's the big one. I mean, we could talk poop for a second. Like that yeah. is a clear sign of your internal wellness. Like, it, yes. and it shows in your skin for sure. And energy yep. levels, all the things you said. But man, you know, pay attention to your bowel movements. Yes. <laughs> that will give you all the information. Yeah. I was talking with uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry. I had him on my podcast last year. And he, and that was actually what, that was the catalyst for me to try more of a plant-based, um, his lectin-free diet. And there's so many benefits to it. And it's, I believe in it. But for me, I just, I knew I needed a little bit more animal protein. Um, but he, going back to talking about poop, he said, when you poop, you should look down in the toilet and it should be one solid looking snake <laughs> it should look like a snake um and if it's anything else then you should you should look at what you're eating and make some adjustments and not just what you're eating lifestyle plays into that you know stress yeah um you, you know but if you're holding clenching it's very common for a lot of people and this year is wreaked havoc i yep. think in many different ways but this year also, is it, like I was saying earlier, it was a time for a lot of awakening. People, I think, also got really healthy this year. They may have kind of gone one extreme like like I did. Yep. Extreme is a heavy word. I wasn't that extreme. But like <laughs> I was definitely, you know, having more alcohol than I normally have. Yep. I was eating. We were eating home every meal, which is awesome. You know, it's going into it. But um, my spouse is a really great cook. 
Yeah. And I was enjoying that, you know? Yep. So it's, uh, yeah. you got to find what works. I for sure in the beginning of quarantine packed on the quarantine 15 as a lot of people were yeah. calling it. And uh, you're right. I think for everyone, we all had our own different journey, but in the also in the beginning, I was not getting as much movement as I normally would, right? I wasn't walking to the train every day like I was. I wasn't, you know, walking to anywhere in the city like I normally was because I was kind of homebound as as we all were. Um, the big change for me was when I got my dog and then I was like, whoa, now I'm walking like 10 to 15,000 steps. <laughs> I got her yeah. towards the middle of, of quarantine. But um, back to exercise, you mentioned something interesting. I think you mentioned uh, the idea of finding joy in our exercise or movement. Why is that important for longevity for uh, not just longevity in terms of living long, but uh, longevity of carrying that practice on for long term um, and consistency? Why is finding joy in exercise so important? Well, I think you just hit on it right there with your dog. Like, by the way, I also got a dog this past year. Nice. <laughs> you know, I think every, everybody got a puppy this year. What um, kind of dog is She's a, she's like a, oh, she's a mutt, but we think she's like pointer mixed with something else. I don't know. She's okay, very cute. Cool. Like 40 yep. pounds. How about you? What kind of dog? Do you yeah, have? she's a Border Collie in lab. Super cute. Okay, very yeah. Sweet. So lots of exercise for that one. Yeah, yeah. But that's a great example, you know, getting out. And you have to every day because the dog's got to go out. And especially mm -hmm. dogs like we have need long walks. They need to run. They need to yep. throw the ball for them, throw sticks, whatever it is. Um, and that's that's essential, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that plays right into what do you enjoy? Um, as you age, you know, I think certainly things like walking and or that's that's something hopefully you can do into old age, you yep. know, whereas, you know, heavy lifting or um, extreme sort of exercises totally do it like it's cool to do it. But you're probably not going to be able. Most people will not be able to do it into old age. So find yeah. things that you just totally dig. I'm a runner, but I was stopped this past like month and a half ago, I'm having a little bit of a knee issue. I have my, yeah. I think it's my lateral meniscus. I have to get it checked out next week. But um, I had to stop running, which is a bummer because I love it. You mm. know, so I'm thinking, okay, what can I do then instead of the running? Certainly the walking, walking the dog is, is it. Yeah. Um, but fine. So interesting. I, have a, I was, I was just saying, a nine-year-old son and he's, um, he's very active. He's a really active kid. But this past nice. year, he's got, got a little chubby. It's sort of common for that age too, and sure. for his body type. But yep. you know, now he's like, and he, he, we kind of exercise during the whole thing, but not so much. But now he's back to like he's playing baseball, he's doing taekwondo, he's yeah. walking the dog with me, and he's going nice. to go to camp this summer. So all that kind of stuff, that movement, I know it's going to make a huge difference for him. Yeah, that's it makes a huge difference because, like you said, if you're not enjoying it, it's not going to stay long term. It's not going to become a habit. Whereas you find something that you enjoy, you're going to want to do it. I guess with the dog example, it's kind of a forced way to like get out. Cause like you said, they have to get out to, to go to the bathroom and everything. Um, but it's, it's huge to find joy. And uh, for me, it just goes hand in hand that you're going to end up doing it more consistently. Um, yeah. I too am a runner and I've, I've taken a break. And I think a lot of that is just cause I'm walking more and I'm, I'm finding other forms of exercise. Um, but yeah, I, I was speaking of extreme, uh, you know, running, so many miles every week and every day running marathons and i think after a while i was like ah, maybe i need to hit the pause button for a little while <laughs> okay <laughs> something that's come back and i and i bought a new pair is rollerblading which i was an avid rollerblader oh, cool. in the 90s like that was my mode of transportation around manhattan and i just yeah. recently got a pair thinking okay i can't run but me i'll rollerblade but actually that was worse on my knees i'm a little bummed uh, so yeah. like when i do heal my knee i'm gonna get back on those things because for me that is really fun and it's going to work different muscles yep. you know and to be outside doing that yep for sure and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about too with experimentation is trying different things and I, I feel like that would be a good thing for me because growing up in the midwest you know we don't have typically we don't do a lot of like physical activity things um you know we you can certainly there's ways to get out and be active but uh it's not like i'm out in west coast hiking and you know surfing and have nice weather to do all these things um so anyhow what i'm getting at is i feel like i have a lot of room for growth and a lot of opportunity for me to find new activities and new um forms of, of exercise that i may enjoy 
Yeah. Um, I, and I think um, when it comes to exercising, if you can grab a buddy, that also really yeah. helps to hold you accountable. You know, True. you can create like a good healthy competition between the two of you. Like when I was running, I was running mostly, not all, not exclusively, but mostly with a friend of mine who lives in my neighborhood. And it was great because, you know, there were days and it was through the winter too, where, you know, it would be like 30 degrees here, 25 degrees, which I, I started to enjoy running in, believe it or not. I actually prefer it now. Um, I was like, oh, and he would text me, it's really cold out there. Are we doing it? And I just, just text him back, yep, come on over. We're doing it. And it was like yes. just knowing that, like, that he was part of it, like, we're going to do it. And that really helps. That does, especially in the wintertime. You and I have cold winters in, in New York and Chicago. Yeah. And for running specifically, um, I know there's been a handful of times, same exact, same thing, where it's early in the morning, it's cold out. I'm like, God, oh, do I really want to do this? And then I get a text from my buddy, and they're like, hey, you're still meeting me at 6 a.m., right? And then, yep, I guess so. <laughs> and once but you do it, you feel good. so good. Like, you exactly. get it done, and you're like, all right, I'm so glad I did it. And if you don't, yeah. not to, not to like beat yourself up over it or feel bad, but you, that does come in, like, oh, I should have just on. So I always think about that the next time. I'm like, how am I going to feel afterwards? Mm. You know, and it just reminds exactly. me, I go, okay, do it. Same thing with eating, you know, what you're putting in your mouth and your body. Cause boy, is it tempting. Just, you know, we're getting into like barbecue season and all this stuff. Yep. Like, okay, I could eat a hot dog or I could go for something else that's available. You know what I mean? Instead yeah. of doing that, which I know is going to make me feel kind of crappy. And it's funny you mentioned with food. I feel like that's, uh, that's only increased for me as I've gotten older, right? Like when I was younger, my meta- metabolism was much faster. Like I could eat pizza and ice cream and oh. chips and, and burgers and whatever, no problem and feel fine. And now that I, I'm getting a little bit older, even if I crave pizza, I might have it every once in a while, but afterwards I just don't feel good. And now I'm like, why eat any of this? Like I sure, I surely, you know, I, I still eat pizza every once in a while and a burger, but um, I know now <laughs> when I Make have it a good pizza, one. You know, right. don't make it, don't make it Domino's, like make it like a really good pizza or really yes. good burger that you're going to enjoy because you're right. It's, I, think it's, I think it's important to, if you love that stuff, like have it once in a while so you don't feel deprived and yep. you enjoy it. So make it, I always say, if you're going to eat chocolate, you know, go for the really good stuff. Don't just yes. get like the, the crappy Easter candy, you know? Yeah. Go for the good stuff. And if you're going to do it, just make that decision and accept it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Don't be like, Oh, I can't believe I'm now having this pizza. What am I doing? And then like get down yeah. on yourself. That's going to make it worse. So, yep. um, very cool. So I know you also mentioned, uh, you have in, in your past, you know, work history, you have experience in massage therapy. I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit more about, um, your work around, massage therapy and then other forms of therapy in the book you're talking about you know chiropractic and acupuncture and hypnosis and naturopathy um tell us a little bit more about some of those different therapies that you have uh, had experience with and then anything that we need to know about any of those therapies yeah. that i've mentioned well i had to write about massage because i i was a massage therapist for i mean i still am but i, I don't practice anymore necessarily um pretty rusty actually i would imagine <laughs> but um I, I had to write about it because you know i just i knew it so well it was innate for me um i did it for so long and i worked mostly with broadway performers so i was really like part of their pit crew to get them able to do eight shows a week mm -hmm. um especially when they're working on like you know dancers on raked stages you know sure. really did a lot of wreaked havoc on their bodies uh, massage i think is essential and when i was in practice i was doing about 20 sometimes 25 massages a week so i was busy wow uh, i was tired but i would make sure i got a, a massage every week for myself because i nice. knew if i was cup for a couple of reasons first of all just to get myself keep myself aligned mm -hmm. but a big thing was just remembering how it feels as a practitioner and i think a lot of practitioners yeah. don't necessarily do this um i hope everyone does but a lot don't um, to get that massage once a week, you're like, oh, that's how that feels. So I'm a better practitioner for my clients, hmm. you know. Um, but I think, you know, whenever some, if anybody, and this happens once in a while, people are like, oh, I don't really like massage. And I think you just had a bad massage somewhere, like on vacation somewhere or something. You decided, to, it's like saying I don't like pizza. Like, yeah. what? You know what I mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> you just had a bad one. So um, it's everybody should have some form of massage on a regular basis if you can and even if you like if budgeting wise you can't really afford it because a lot of people will look at it as a luxury i mm -hmm. don't look at it as a luxury but there's ways to find 
Um, you could do like some sort of an exchange. Maybe you have a service to offer to a massage therapist that you, yep. know, you could do a trade with them or you could seek out like massage therapy schools. They offer clinics where the students and they're usually students that are at the end of their training. So they know what they're doing at this point. And you can go in and it's very low cost, like, you know, I don't know, twenty, twenty five dollars for an hour, or an hour and a half massage. So there's ways to nice. to do that. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah, for me, I I love it for muscle recovery. I had the best massage I ever had was the day after I ran the Chicago Marathon in 2017, and what a game changer! That was one of the first massages I've had, and I remember just like the next few days. I mean, after a marathon for that next like few days and week, you're you're going to be kind of beat anyhow. But having that massage the the day after, I think it was two days after. Um, Right. Total game changer in recovery. Yeah. So that's that's great. Um, it's it's for athletes, it's essential. You yep. must. You yep. must do it. And um, yes, it feels good. And you know, honestly, massage doesn't always just feel good. Like sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, a little painful, you know, mm. but the, the muscles need to be released. There's certain, you know, trigger point therapy. Um, yeah. The deep work that needs to happen sometimes. I used to, on my dancers, I used to have to release the psoas, which is a muscle that's deep within the abdomen. Not yep. so easy to get to, but man, that had to be worked. And it would be like <laughs> the look on their faces. Sometimes they'd have to like bite on a towel. To, but I had to get in there and it would give us a release to release the hips and everything. And it's amazing what that would open up for people. And it was emotional too, because that's yeah. all tied in. All your emotions are tied into your muscles. So massage on many levels. You know, and then there's lots of other modalities, of course, beyond massage. You for know, sure. That's great. You give a lot of good resources there for massage therapy. What if somebody is that's listening is interested in learning more about some of those other therapies that you talk about, um, you know, like acupuncture and Reiki? What are some things that maybe either resources or just some kind of basic things that we, we can learn about uh, with those other therapies? Hey guys, I wanna take a quick second to tell you about Kion, which provides natural supplements and clean coffee for vibrant health. Kion Coffee is in the top 3% of all coffee grown worldwide that can claim to be specialty grade, which means it's free from yeast, pesticides, mold, and mycotoxins. It's also one of the best cups of coffee I've ever had. Kion also has a really great aminos product that aids in better sleep, post-exercise recovery, provides fast, clean energy, supports fasting, and improves cognitive performance. Experience the energy and performance benefits of Kion Aminos today. To get 15% off your order of Kion Coffee or any of their products and supplements, visit getkion.com slash danvoss and enter code danvoss, that's D-A-N-V-O-S-S, at checkout for 15% off your order. I mean, we're so lucky because we have the internet and we can Google and really, you know, dive in and learn about stuff. Um... I, I always encourage people try everything. Mm. Just make one, you know. Try go for go for acupuncture. Typically, with acupuncture, you need a couple of appointments to see to sort of get any results. But even just to experience it once, and make yeah. sure you go to somebody who's licensed, <laughs> somebody who's you know experienced, especially if it's your first time going. Mm. Um, so you really have a good experience with it. Um, chiropractic is you know is another thing. You know, chiropractic isn't just like getting your back cracked. There's a lot involved. A lot of chiropractors work a lot with nutrition and different massage techniques and um, trigger point release and all that. So, you know, there some of these modalities like kind of layer on top of each other. Um, Reiki is, an, you know, it's, of course, there's all different kinds of energy work. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm a Reiki practitioner. And cool. I, I, yeah, I, that was you know, I did that training years ago, and um, I joke I used to use it to find parking spots, which I actually really did. <laughs> I know it sounds like a little voodoo, but it would work. Um, but it's Is that amazing. Right? It's amazing when you're with someone who's attuned to Reiki. That means they're a Reiki practitioner. They've been attuned, and they're sitting with you. And I would use it during like my massage sessions. Cool. And people, I would never tell them, but people were like, "I don't know what you do, Larry." <laughs> but like beyond the massage work, but they're like, there's something going on beyond because I had like this outer body experience, whatever. People would have these interesting reactions. Yeah. And I kind of knew it was going on, you know, but um, sure. it's just a deeper healing 
you know it's an energetic healing that happens and you really can't describe it it's something you have to experience yes it's it's a fascinating practice i had dr john emerald on my podcast a month or so ago and that was like the first exposure i had to the practice um, just researching it and learning about it and i gotta be honest like when you don't know anything about it and you first hear about it you're like what that's some weird voodoo yeah. whatever <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, but, and your energy work. Okay. Yeah, we're right. <laughs> um, but he did. He explained that you know it's uh, it's very experiential. You you can't really explain it in words. You you can try, but you're not going to really understand the true benefits of it unless you experience it. And that's when I was like, ah, that makes that makes. It's sense. like trying to describe love. You know what I mean? Like, how do you describe yeah. that? You just have right. to. You don't know until you know and you mm. experience it. Yep. And then you. It's go, a good oh. analogy. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good analogy. So for those that are listening that are like, what are these guys talking about? You can look up Reiki or energy healing, energy therapy. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about meditation. I know it's something you, you touch on in the book. Um, a, I, well, a, do you meditate? I'm assuming yes. And B, what, what kind of meditation do you enjoy? Very simple. And for me, it was tough. You know, I, I, I grew up around... Um, my dad, who did yoga before yoga was a thing. My dad's 90 now. Mm-hmm. Um, and he still practices a bit, but he's he's got a lot of health challenges now. But when, I remember being I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? He'd be in the living room, like doing the lion's pose, which is like, ah, like you stick your tongue out. And it's just it's <laughs> crazy. I'm like, what's going on? Um, and he would meditate. He would do all that. Um, so I sort of grew up around it. But for me, I think it's 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 more important than ever now but it's also harder than ever now because we're always on screens you know we always have our phones and computers and there's like yeah. information coming at us all the time i always say and this is how i started and i still just do like very simple meditation even if it's like two minutes or five minutes yep. before bed yep um it's a great time to start you know to sort of calm your mind calm yourself down and just close turn everything off Focus on your breath. And what happens is when you meditate, especially when you're new at doing it, your mind will start to like, it starts talking at you. Yes. And instead of getting like, frustrated or mad about it, you got to just acknowledge it. It's that yogi mind. You got to acknowledge, okay, I'm thinking that. You let it go and breathe. Yeah. Keep focusing on your breath. And you'll get eventually into a deeper place where that won't happen as much. I think it always will happen. Thoughts will come in. I and mean, when we strive for like totally clearing the mind. But again, it's mm. like that, you know, that, that balance that we're like, that we're never probably ever going to actually achieve, but it's yep. going for it. And that's the journey too. You know, they always say it's tough. It's, the journey is the best part. It's really true. When you finally reach the top of the mountain, it's like, it's cool, but okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Meditation for me has been such a crucial practice in my wellness i've been i've been practicing meditation for about seven or eight years now um and i practice and i think you mentioned it in the book is uh tm transcendental meditation it, there's there's something i it, it's kind of like the reiki therapy it's like it's hard to put it into words what meditation does for me and how it's changed my life but very in very simple terms it's allowed me to focus more throughout the day um, which is kind of an obvious one. Um, it's allowed me to be more more patient. And the best analogy I can kind of think of with meditation is like pre, before I meditated, um, I kind of lived life just sporadically, right? I just went to wherever I need to go. I went to a meeting. I worked on this project. I answered these emails. I just... I kind of just led life without any clear vision. And now I feel like I'm the quarterback of the football team where I can kind of direct my players where to go. I can direct my wide receiver to go this route and I can make calls. And it's not about manipulating things, but it's about leadership. It's about giving direction to areas of your life that might need a little bit more direction. And, and for me, that's what meditation has, has given uh, to me, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts. What has meditation done for you in, in your life? Similar to you, it, it's brought me a lot of clarity. And mm. there's um, many moments where I have to be a leader, especially when I'm producing a show. 
um, yep. or or I lead a team of interns that work with me with Urban Body Fix. Um, so I need to have that sort of that clear mind where, you know, because people are, are looking to me for direction. Mm -hmm. Also, um, and certainly, you know, I'm raising a kid, and yep. it's that's like a test at every turn. I mean, it's just just one one kid. You know, other people have like three, four, five kids. So I'm like, <laughs> it's ooh, one. It's one luck. more than me. So, well, <laughs> kudos. Yeah. To so, <laughs> learning to, um, I, I, th I think meditation practice helps with that, and I, and I've been also teaching him the same thing to take mm. time to take a deep breath. I don't yeah. call it meditation with him, but like, let, let's take a deep breath together. Yep. You know, and then let's talk about what's been happening. And that really makes a huge difference. Yep. This is pivoting over to, to breath work because you mentioned the word breath. Um, There's a really cool video that came out. I think I saw it on Instagram a month or two ago. And it was these two boys. I think they were brothers. And it was like an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. And the five-year-old was having what you, you could probably describe as a form of a panic attack. Like he was hysterically crying and losing like control of his breath. And his brother told him to just like pause take a deep breath and he like guided him through it and he's like breathe in and breathe out and he did that with him a few times and then the kid stopped crying and he got wow. over it it was really cool to see to see that at that's young of an age as well um, i wonder what their parents really are cool. like like if they're yeah yogis, he had to, or do they meditate he learned it somewhere he i was just gonna say he had to have learned that somewhere whether that was parents a teacher but there was some adult in his life that influenced him and it was just so neat to see at such a young age mm. and to have that practice too for, for, for life now. Right. I wish I knew at that young of an age I know. how to control Schools my breath. Incorporate, they incorporate yoga class now, depending on the school, you mm. know, and it definitely, these kids are benefiting from it in a great way. And they're yeah. growing up in such a different world. than when we grew up, you know what I mean? They just, the access that they have is insane. Yeah, you know, it you is. Can, you can shield them from it as long as you want, but eventually their friends have it, so they're going to be exposed. And it's yep. like you have to, you know, that's that's the thing about being a parent. <laughs> you, you, you bring up a really good point. Um, in terms of technology, you had just alluded to a few moments ago, you know, we have screens, we have all of these notifications, we have social media, all of this technology in our life. And I think that's what, uh, the biggest benefit of meditation is that allows us to just pause and slow down and refocus and not have all these distractions take over. Um, so that's kind of like the negative side of technology, but then in, there's also the positive side where it, we, it gives us so much access to information, to knowledge, to resources, to practices like breath work and meditation. And I mean, you can learn just about anything you want on Google or YouTube uh, or wherever on, on the internet. So um, that's a really good point. And it also brings me to the idea of meditation. You know, I know you, you talked about in the book in terms of just starting out to maybe start with guided meditations or the apps, which I think are great resources. And I started there. But then I think after a little while, it's good to graduate to a, a different form of, of meditation. And even with, I mentioned TM, I was using a timer app to kind of time the 10 minutes or 20 minutes of that meditation. And then I was listening to uh, on Joe Rogan's podcast. It was Naval Ravikant talk about um, meditation. And he described it as the act of doing nothing. And he talked about how when he, pre when he meditates, he does not use any technology, no phone, no app, no timer, because meditation is the act of doing nothing. It's meant to sit there and quiet everything and not focus on a timer or anything. So when I heard that, I was like, wow, I guess I'll put my phone away. I'm not going to even use a timer. I'll just sit and whatever feels right, feels right. So that's kind of my, that's really, my new practice. That's, that's really good actually. Um, and first of all, just going back to the technology conversation for a second, we never would have met if it wasn't for technology, right? This exactly. wouldn't be happening right now. Exactly. So many amazing things come out of having this incredible technology. This whole past year, I, I, I shudder to think what would have this year, would have, what would have happened while we were all, you know, um, solitary and if we didn't have Zoom and ways to connect yeah. with each other, it's been a godsend in a sense. Yeah. Um, but I think you're right. Eventually, like we have to, 
use it in a smart way, but also know when to turn it off and to step yes. away from it and be in life. Yeah. And, um, you know, get off the social media and not get yeah. hung up on the, oh, what are they doing? What are they wearing? What, are, what kind of, what's, oh, they got a new house? All that kind of yep. BS. Yep. You know, and just be. And, yes. <laughs> and, it, and it's, it's funny. I love, you know, do, doing meditation without a timer, without thinking about it. I'm going to do this for five minutes or 10 minutes just to do it. Yep. You know, it's a different ball it. game. Yeah. It's a different yeah. experience. And to that point of finding that balance of, you know, using technology for, for good. And there's so many ways to use it for good, but then also knowing when to kind of shut it down and step away from it. I like to go when I go out on my walks now, or if I go into a very nature-esque setting, um, I will put my phone on airplane mode, especially if I know nobody needs me for any reason. I'll still have my phone on me in case I need to use it for an emergency, make a call. But otherwise, I'm turning that on airplane mode, so I'm not being bugged, and I can just enjoy what's around me. Yeah, that's my this. Th okay, so I had a dog from before this dog for she was 16, almost 16 when she died. So a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was my thing with her is every morning I would go out, I live across the street from this really great park and I would not bring my phone. It's like yeah. the one time a day I don't have my phone with me and I continue now that we have this new dog because we went two and a half years without having a dog. Uh, and now that we have a dog again, it's just a practice that I've started again of that morning walk. I, technology doesn't come with me. And yep. It makes the biggest difference. I'm actually, mm. well, the dog makes you present too, because they're right. so present. Sure. Like you sure, just got to sure. be like, you know, in it and uh, not having that distraction. It's great. Yeah. I, I too have done the same thing. I, in the beginning having the dog going out several walks, I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity for me to have my earphones in uh, or my headphones in and uh, listen to music or podcasts or YouTube videos. Cause I do, I love all of those things. I love learning and I, I, Whenever I have an opportunity to listen to audio, I take it. But then last month or so, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go out on these walks without my phone. It doesn't need to be on me at all times. I'll be okay for 10 minutes without my phone. And it's it's been a nice new practice. Right. Yeah. I mean, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Somebody somebody else will have a phone if, you know, if there's an emergency or whatever. It true. Doesn't... Especially where you and I so, live. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we get so tethered to these things and it's nice to be untethered. It is 100%. Let it go. go. It's amazing if you go off for a full day. People freak out. They're like, where were you? I texted you at 10 a.m. and it's you know, 6 p.m. Where were you? It's crazy. And so I know. you almost you have, you have to train people. You have to train your community, people around you sometimes, or let them know, like, look, I'm off the grid today. Mm. You're not going to hear from me. Yeah. It's just so crazy. They have to let people know that now. I like <laughs> it. It is true. I like to disappear sometimes. I just I do. I like to go, even if it means, you know, in the city, like to just disappear for the whole day, wander around New York City. It's one of my favorite things to do. Maybe uh, you could do this in Chicago too, because it's I a do, walking yeah. city here and I just love it. Love yep. it, love it, love it. Even even despite the all the crap you're hearing on the news lately, all dangerous, dangerous it's not. I mean, yeah. maybe there's some danger. It's a city, but right. know, it's glorious. No, I'm, it really is. I'm with you. I, I enjoy doing the same thing in Chicago, but... Um, I know in New York, I've, I've been to New York once and it's, it's even better than Chicago for those types of things. Just get lost. And, uh, I mean, not necessarily like truly lost, but like lost in your <laughs> well, mind. Maybe you right? did like, since you only came one time, but <laughs> it's pretty easy to get lost here actually. So, well, that's a grid. It's not that hard. Yeah. It's not too hard. I think it's more nice to just like let your mind wander and not worry about what's going on or what the work that you have to do. Just like go out when and I'm, enjoy. And, I'll t and one of my biggest joys in life is meeting people. Like, I just love to connect. You can probably get this about me. And <laughs> if I'm really present, even when I'm walking, like, I, I'm like my dad. And I used to get so, when I was a kid, I was so annoyed. My dad would talk to everybody. My mom, too. She'd be like at the yeah. supermarket. She would start talking. To the, I'm like, oh, come on. And now I do it. <laughs> yep. My son probably hates it and will hate it even more when he's, when he's a teenager. But that's one of my joys in life is like, because you connect with people and actually be interested in them. It's not about you. It's like, what are you about? The most fascinating things come out of it. Yeah, it's so true. It's so funny you mentioned that you're you're like your dad now, where you like to stop and talk with people. <laughs> My dad, yeah. he'll do the same thing, but especially at restaurants. And it, I'm, I'm it just the reason why I'm talking about this because I just saw a commercial. I think it was uh, Geico or something similar, where they they have some funny commercials. 
Oh, and, about, uh, about what your parents do? Like, don't be, yeah. you're not old yeah. enough to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and okay. one of the examples was um, like being at a restaurant and you, like, you don't have to tell the waitress your name. They don't need yeah. to know who our names are. <laughs> my dad will always do that when we go out and be like, oh, I have my son Dan here. And I'm like, they don't need to know my name. <laughs> so when I saw that commercial, it definitely gave me a good chuckle. I kind of do that sometimes. Oh, God, people must hate me. But I <laughs> it's funny. We, we, we tend to turn into our parents. Yeah. Um, we are obviously smiling and laughing right now, which leads me to, to my next point. And something you talk about in the book is the importance of smiling and laughing a lot. Why is that so important, especially in today's world where you oh. turn on the news and it's, it, they make it sound like the whole world's on fire. We all dealt with tons of stress and anxiety within the last year and a half with the pandemic. Um, why is it so important to focus on smiling and laughter? Anytime I speak, I end with, with this. Like any anytime I'm out there giving a workshop or something, I end with this smiling and laughing. And I always hope that like this the seminar that I gave provided people with smiles and laughter. We had a good time because that's what people will remember. They will not remember the information, but they'll remember how they feel, yeah. right? I think it's essential. And I think we take life way too seriously. We have to laugh about it. We have to. Look, there's some things that are heavy in life and some things that are serious, sure. totally. But you can't dwell there. You can't live there for too long, right? Because yep. the, the best things you remember are the times when you are, when you're deeply feeling and there's, there's humor there and there's laughter there and there's joy there. Mm. And there's been lots of studies on it. You know, you could look up these studies about how, yep. you know, it, it, your, your health, you'll, you'll live longer if you're laughing more, right? Um, it, What's always interesting to me, because people think, oh, when I achieve this, when I have this much money, then I'm really going to be happy. It is not true. You look at some of the poorest countries in the world, they laugh more, just as much or more than the richest countries in the world. It yep. has nothing to do with that, right? I remember some of my, my, and I still laugh a lot, but some of my best memories and the hardest laughs I've had was when I was just broke. Yeah. I was like a struggling actor in New York City or yeah. when I was in college, like, you know, waiting tables because to pay for tuition like i i laughed harder than than most other times like it, it has nothing to do with it you know mm. really being present it, you'll get so present when you're in that moment of laughing and enjoying yeah it's, it's so true i mean i think what it comes down to is happiness and for me something i've learned really kind of recently is that yeah, we have things in life that uh, are thrown our way, bad things, we face adversity. But at the end of the day, we have the choice to be happy or not. And again, I'm I'm not trying to make light of, you know, things that happen. There's dark things that happen. There's a lot of situations that come up that are tough. But we still have that choice on how we react to it and whether yeah. we're going to be happy or not. Yeah, life is going to happen all the time and bad things yep. are going to happen. But yep. how do you react to it? Yep. You know? Yeah. And with laughter, I my new favorite thing, I don't I try to step away from watching T V, but um when I do, my my new favorite thing to watch on Netflix now is stand up comedy acts. Um, especially on Friday or Saturday night when, you know, cause lately we haven't had that opportunity to, to go out to stand up comedy shows. So now I go over to Netflix. Um yeah. but I, I do believe that if people had that in their life, you know, if they went to a stand-up comedy show once a month or even once a quarter, I think we would live in a much better world. I think people would be happier, laughed, as you've mentioned, laughter is just healthy for all of us. You know, it's good for well, our I mental health. I think about who do you surround yourself with, you know? Are those people making you feel like your best self, mm. you know? Um, do you laugh with them? Those are important things to look at. when you got to sort of look at your relationships, you know what I mean? In your life, sometimes you need to clear some out They're, they're just not, maybe it's a relationship you've had for a really long time. It could be someone in your family, right? And it's not serving you well. That's going to have a huge impact on your health. You know, hundred percent. I am, I, I'm very proud that I cultivate, I have cultivated my friendships over the years. Like I have a couple of friends that I've been friends with since like, um, more college, college age. I'm 48 now. So that's a good long time, mm -hmm. you know, um, not a lot of them, but there's some that I've really, like I've remained really close with and they're not like the most successful people or whatever, but there's something, there's a connection there. And 
we get together and there is laughter and there's joy yeah. and there's fun and there's there's um caring and there's lots of love love that yeah it's so awesome i love i i, I love what you just said about you know they might not necessarily be the most successful in terms of our like societal norms or they make a ton of money or they have big status or really big career or big job but you enjoy your time around them you know they cultivate love they cultivate laughter and smiling and you feel good when you're with them and i think that's one of the best indicators of a good friend or a, a strong friendship mm -hmm. is that when you leave that outing or that get together you actually feel good rather than feeling drained or feeling that negativity well you know you ever have like one of those like lunches or coffee or juice or beer or whatever with somebody and it's like you know two hours goes by and you're like wow that felt like yeah. five minutes right that's that's when because you, you're not like sitting gossiping you know you're talking about ideas and fun stuff and you're making each other yeah. laugh and and it's interesting those are the kind of relationships you know that i'm talking about 100 and i feel that same thing with this conversation i think we're going on an hour here about yeah. almost an hour yeah, yeah. and i feel like it's, it's been quick. a 10 minute conversation right yeah agreed. um agreed. awesome well on that note larry uh where can people find more about you and, and learn about your work and your book sure so um my website is urbanbodyfix.com super easy i'm on all the socials thanks to my interns because oof, social media um it's <laughs> at urban body fix you can find me you know on instagram and twitter and Facebook. I'm even on TikTok. I have a TikTok nice. page, which has some fun videos there. Um, yeah, in my book, you know, you can find the book on my website or you can just go right to Amazon and grab it. It's available in paperback or you can just download the e, the e version to your Kindle cool. or whatever. Um, but I think it's a nice addition to have in your library to actually have the physical book. Because to mm -hmm. me, this book is it's really the the kind of thing that you can sort of keep turning back to there's, there's a yeah. lot of good info in there and it's there is. covers a lot of territory so i hope that people use it as um to learn a few new things yep. and um to realize some things about themselves and turn to it from time to time and say i need to reread that chapter i need a little reminder here something that's stuck out a lot that i've gotten a lot of feedback on regarding the book is people say oh is exactly what I needed to read right now because I'm a person of extremes mm. and I needed to hear this that okay sometimes I need to be go to those extremes to find the middle ground and that's yeah. been really cool to hear because then it write it with that necessarily that in mind but that's what yep. came out that's cool. that's cool that's really good feedback and it shows that a lot of people are experiencing that and they, they obviously need to hear it um, and I think they also probably need to hear that they're not the only ones that are like that yeah. that they that they go yeah. to extremes and then realize, oh, maybe I need to step it back a little bit. And uh, kind of goes along with everything we've been talking about is finding your way, experiment, try new things, figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So, um, yeah, definitely for those listening, check out the book. I think I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation that there's so much in there that as I was going through it, I'm like, wow, there's so much that aligns with what I enjoy and what I talk about on this podcast. And it's a really good resource to have just to, to go back to it with whatever uh, phase or period in life that you're in, whatever you're, you're going through or challenges that you're facing. There's a lot of resources there to kind of guide you along. Thanks, Dan. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Larry, my last question for you is your definition of health. Um, what does health mean to you? Uh, vibrancy. I think that you can be healthy, like physically healthy, maybe, but if you're not vibrant, meaning mm -hmm. all the things we just talked about, like, because it's really a wheel, right? There's your your um, dietary health, there's your exercise health, yep. you know, your physical health, and there's, there's your mental health, your spiritual health, the health of your relationships, your career. It's really nurturing all those areas. That's true health. Well, a true wellness, I guess, actually is even a better term for it. Mm. You know, um, it's not just one thing because if you don't have all the other parts, so what if you're, you know, drinking, you know, kale juice every day, or whatever it is you're doing, if you're taking a great supplement, you know, okay, but if you don't have great relationships that really fulfill you, what does it matter? Mm. You know, you're probably going to become unhealthy even though you're 
putting all the good food and supplements in your body, which is great. But if you're not nurturing all the other areas, there's going to be, it's going to catch up with you. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I've always said that, uh, one of the greatest things about health and wellness is how interconnected everything is. As you had mentioned, you know, it, you have your nutrition and your, your relationships and, uh, your mental health and your physical health and sleep and all these things interconnect and you don't have to get it all right at once. You don't have to be perfect in every single area at all times. Um, but as long as you know, general framework for each of those areas, you can start building up a really good foundation. So, uh, Larry, this is great. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate your time. Right on. Thanks, Dan. Great talking to you. You too. Have a great day.